Hello friends, this is our 41st lecture on the history of the English language and uh, in the last lecture we saw Renaissance, that is 1500-1650 and uh, the changes that took place during uh, Renaissance and uh, the impact of these changes on the development growth of the English language. So we saw that uh, there were four changes occurred in four areas. First we saw the printing press. It was like dropping a bombshell. I, I, I can say like that. So tremendous change. From manuscript to printing. Thousands and thousands of copies of books printed. Otherwise it would take sometimes months to uh, make a copy of a copy of a book by writing with your hands and that is manuscript. Second uh, stage we saw in the area of popular education. How the middle class people, it was so accessible to them. Education which was reserved for a few, the rich class that was opened the flat gates of education, popular education will open to the middle class people. So that is popular education means. Understand? So what happens the literacy? The percentage of literacy increased, that's the point. And then we saw that communication and increase the means of communication. And I, as I told you yesterday, you will you feel like laughing when I say it was the radio, telegraph and all those things. <laughs> Isn't it? And travel and communication as as a result of trading and things like the commerce, trading, see, so that is, you would say that, oh, what are these things, isn't it? But those days, these things were very important and significant, I guess. Okay, then we have one of the fourth area that was, you, get, you, you saw, social consciousness. So people wanted to use, see, they wanted to use the, the accent of the upper class people. So that is consciousness, that is English, the patriotic feeling and the, also the feeling that we are something. That is, we should uh, not be country, we should not remain country, but we should remain civilized and uh, we speak like the London people or the speak London English. Understand? So that is a four area. Now, as a result of this increased activity, as a result of these changes, we can say cataclysmic changes, no? sudden changes. No? It is like you getting up in the, you go to sleep in the Middle Ages, get up in the modern age. You can see, you can't adjust, you know. It's very difficult for you to adjust. It is something like this, suppose, you are, I am a poor man and I get a lottery, let's say uh, 30 crores, 40 crores, what would I do? So things will not happen, that's another thing, but Suppose it happens, sometimes I will faint and die. So it is, it is better not to get, isn't it? Yeah. So the pressure is so much, you know, the pressure of the change. As a result of this, vernaculars, the problems faced by vernaculars. Vernaculars, that is French, Italian and English. This verna vernacular means when you contrast it with classical, you know it better. Means classical languages in Latin Greek. And the other languages, it is descended from this popular language, so you can say, you can call it vernacular. Uh, native of a place, the native language of a place. French is the native language of France. Italy, Italy is the native language of Italy. And England is, I said, English is the native language of England. So these are vernacular species. Hindi is the native language of India, so we say Hindi is vernacular, but Sanskrit is classical. Okay, perfect. So, three problems these uh, vernaculars faced. See, first is the problem of recognition. A problem of recognition. Second is a problem of, of orthography. Orthography means writing, the right writing. Orthography or so right writing, right writing. Because 
you remember when uh, old English and Middle English you have to write strange letters like this. Huh? So one like this, you remember. Then there was a diagraph, you saw. So it's a strange letters were there. So some people were still using this. So they had to standardize. It was necessary for the, for the English speaking people to standardize their writing, spelling, fixing the spelling. Of course, the whole thing was fixed in 1755 by the great man, a genius, that monumental genius, that is uh, Dr. Johnson, that comes in the 18th century. Now here it is, this different thing. So this, this had to be, somehow there should be an agreement that they had to fix the, the letters, alphabet to 26, and you should say that all the uh, different areas in England should use these 26. So that is fixing or you can say fixing the spelling or, or orthography, right writing. And the third is a problem of enrichment, a problem of enrichment. Enrichment, we have already seen language has been enriched by foreign influences. Which are, which are the foreign influences? Celtic, Latin, three times, four times, isn't it? Four times. So the zero period, first period, second period, third period. And then we had a uh, Scandinavian and French, yes, flooding of French words. So, that, so these things happen, but still, when it comes to Renaissance and those English activity, see, for example, if you run for 10 miles, you you are uh, energy, you know, you have to you take, you, you have to replenish your energy. See that? Like that. Now, the English activity, translation, reading, literacy, popular education, printing, Social consciousness, communication, so you needed a very rich vocabulary for this. So that is a problem of enrichment. So we can see the changes, the sudden changes that took place. It's like as uh, already told you, go to sleep in the Middle Ages and get up early in the morning in the Renaissance, the period of Renaissance. You can see how it is difficult to, to adjust, you know. And that's what happened to the vernacular source. Difficult to adjust. See the reason, and therefore they face the three problems. As you remember now when you go first to the, you, the first day in your uh, nursery school, how many problems you might have faced. So you are transplanted from the, the cozy atmosphere that the uh, sumptuousness and luxury of your parents love. First time you are going to another place. And you are like a fish out of water. Like that. So these people are this English language, especially and the vernaculars, and as far as we are concerned, this English language face the three main problems. One is a problem of recognition, secondly, a problem of orthography or right writing, and thirdly, a problem of enrichment. So today we will deal, I think partially. Not the whole thing, because that would be that would take long no? time. It's a time-consuming affair, and you, you may find it difficult to listen to me for more than 20 minutes or 20, 25 minutes. So I will confine it to that, and we will continue the second part of the problem of recognition tomorrow. Tomorrow in the next class. Okay. So problem of recognition. What, what is the situation? The situation was classical languages had a complete sway over, means complete control over philosophy, theology and disputes in um, science, medicine and all these things. Because these were written, books were written in Greek and Latin, that is classical language. So people said that, you know, oh, it is the Latin and Greek, they are key to the world's knowledge. So that's for support of classical tradition. So it is in the, you have to understand it in the context of classical tradition. Classical tradition. And what is classical tradition? Supporting the use of uh, classical tradition versus, you can say, battle, vernacular. Vernacular, vernaculars. This is the situation. Classical languages were Greek and Latin. Greek and Latin. So, those people who support the classical tradition, they said, in Latin and Greek, they are key to the world's knowledge. 
they have got universal currency. Universal currency. Ah, key to philosophy all the books, esteemed poetry, philosophy, treatise on philosophy, theology, astronomy, and all these things. These are written in Latin and Greek. And uh, I in no other uh, Latin and Greek they are so perfect languages that things are very clear. There is no doubt when you say. But if, when you start writing it in uh, in vernaculars, the vernaculars they are not uh, they they are not uh, rich enough. Their vocabulary is not rich enough to express strange abstract concepts in philosophy and theology and so on. So they say they are not mature enough. They are immature. The vernaculars are immature. So you should not leave disputes of philosophy, theology, medicine and so on in the hands of the vernacularists. Secondly, they said that it has got a universal currency, Latin and Greek. Anywhere if you go, just as me say no, no. English has got universal currency. Anywhere you, you can somehow manage with it. some English. So that anywhere in the world. Even if you go to the uh, land of Eskimos, they will also, they can speak to them. Speak means they can say bread, butter, and things like that. You can, you can somehow survive. Understand, that is. So here they say this. First, uh, the first uh, point is key to the world's knowledge. Key to the world's knowledge. But all the uh, esteemed books are written in there. Secondly, they said that it is universal currency. Universal currency. That means it is spoken everywhere. Latin and Greek, anywhere in Europe, if you go, you can manage to survive. Because all the books are written there, universities, they are using Latin and Greek. Among the academics, it is very common and current. Therefore, anywhere you go, you can manage that sort of Third point, they said this, that they uh, that it is perfect. Latin and Greek, perfect, perfect classical, you know, classic. When you say classic, what do you mean? It's classic. Homer, Homer's uh, Iliad is a classic, means perfect. So classical language, perfect language. And language is, uh, you have got words, you have got vocabulary. It is so rich, it can, it can express any concept, difficult. The concepts in philosophy, science, and, and and other such subjects. So these are the three. And fourth point they said is, if you leave disputes of philosophy and theology in the hands of vernacular, vernacular is unable to cope up with it. Because they are not rich enough. They are not. So vernacular is imperfect. Vernaculars, vernaculars, Imperfect, and not mature, immature this, imperfect and immature. So don't uh, leave theology, philosophy, disputes and things like that, discussions in philosophy, etc. in the hands of Bernalcus, because it will only confuse, confusion is confounded as uh, Shakespeare said. So, so that's what it is. Against this, you have got the champions of modern languages. This vernacular, especially English. In England, you had champions like Richard Malcaster. There's a hero among them, Richard Malcaster. He was the headmaster of uh, Richard Malcaster. He was the headmaster of HM of Merchant Taylor's School. Merchant Taylor's School. So he said, he declared. And the another person was Thomas Eliot, a great translator. Thomas Ian Vayoti. Not Thomas Thurn Eliot, that is T.S. Here it is now, Ian Vayoti. So he said, they said, he said, I love Rome. Richard Malcaster said, I love Rome. But London better. Rome means Latin language. I love, uh, I love, I will write it, I will do, this is a very famous quotation, so I request you, you also write this down and try to quote this in your uh, answer. So, I love Rome, Richard Malcaster is, Richard 
Malkashna sir. I love Rome. See, I love Rome, but London better. But London better. So what does that mean? I love, I have got regard, I have got the, uh, respect for Rome means Latin, classical language. But I, but London better. London means English. I love it, but a degree, a higher degree it is a, I love London better. I favor Italy, but England more. I favor Italy, but London, sorry, England, England more. Same. Italy is Latin again. I love Italy, but uh, I favor Italy, but England more. I honor the Latin, but I worship the English. I honor the Latin, but I worship the English. So this is what he said. Look at this. Champions, of, one of the champions, one of the staunch Supporters of the use of English. Staunch, strong. That's a revolutionary, you can say. That is. What did he say? These are his words. He said, I love Rome, but London better. I favor Italy, but England more. I honor the Latin. I have got respect for Latin. I have got respect for the ancient language. But I worship the English. Honoring somebody and worshipping somebody is different. If you honor me, you will say good morning, sir. If you worship me, you will do like this. Please don't do <laughs> such thing to me. Eh? Because there is no point in worshipping a human being. Yes. So this is what I say. Did you get it? The spirit. From this you can understand the spirit of the age. From this you can understand the attitude of the people. They respect, but they worship their mother. Understand? So this is. So you can see great writers and great translators. Thomas Eliot, that is a great translator. And education here, Richard Malkast. See? So yeah, this, he said like this. From this you can understand uh, that uh, although there is a classical tradition that is equally important, equally powerful after the after 1500, that is during Renaissance you have got the, that support for English. So the problem of recognition is going to be solved. The problem of recognition of the vernacular, the infant language is going to be solved. Now, classical languages like giants, see that? But this English, like Italian, French and so on, like infants, imagine. So they have to come up to that level. And they need support. The second point is recognition is popular demand. Popular demand. The people demand that should be in English. What? Say that all this knowledge, this military science, government, statecraft, then philosophy, theology. Science, medicine, astronomy, these are all written in Latin and Greek. And we don't understand. We can't read. The people said, the middle class people said. They are they are the seventy percent of the people are middle class. So we want we want to enjoy the fruits of Renaissance. Come on, let us also know what is what the ancients have written. So if you just confine this or limit this to Latin and Greek, how will we know it? So it's pop, there is popular demand, strong popular demand. They said that we want to enjoy the fruits of Renaissance. So give us, and give us in a language that is known to us. That's it. 
You give this knowledge to us. We are thirsting for it. We want to be voracious readers of these books. But we can't do it in Latin and Greek. Because it's something that we, it is beyond our, our ability to understand. So give us this, as all well this. Popular demand. We want to read books on conduct. We want to read books on ethics. We want to know what these ancients have done. What the ancient Aristotle, Plato, great historians, what they have written, you want to know. So that is another reason for the recognition of, uh, for, uh, for English to gain recognition. Popular demand. Demands to share the fruits of, uh, share in the fruits of Renaissance. And third is, of course, this is also very important, that is translations. So as a result of this demand, the translation industry, so to say, and translation industry flourished. All those names you remember when I was, when we were discussing Sir Philip Sidney, you had come across uh, Theocritus, then Thucydides, Tacitus, Herodotus, see, then you had uh, Aristotle, Plato, you are Isocrates, Caesar, Seneca. So these names familiar. I suppose you are familiar with this because if you are not familiar, all these names I have explained in my lectures on Sir Philip Sidney. So I hope that you are following that. No? You are also reading that because for your mates, uh, I think it is a compulsory topic. No? It's a must for you to... Who well, is the modern critic? The first modern critic is Sir Philip Sidney. Some people say Sir Philip Sidney is the father of modern criticism. Some others say it is Dryden. I know what all it is. Let's not get into this dispute. Because both of them they have made their great contributions to literary theory. Okay. So then you see that in the translation, see? Historians, Thucydides, then Xenophon. Thucydides and Xenophon were English. English, a new word for you. English before Shakespeare went to school. And it is just clear that history was in great demand. History. Translations of history. History is that it is very delectable and profitable to read. About history, there was a saying very delectable, delectable and profitable profitable to read so bookshops you know they will they will display this book history translations of this xenophon then you have got the uh, uh, historian Thucydides Herodotus Roman there this Greek so available here and there just uh, as a sales promotion technique, they will write like this, very delectable and profitable to read. So, people rushed into bookshops and they are very seconds. They're so greedy about reading this book. It's like a floodgate opening. So, this to see, uh, there is a uh, as I told you, in a her, her, to see the editions and often they were uh, translated before Shakespeare went to school and Herodotus before he began his dramatic career. Caesar by Arthur Goldig was translated in 1565. Caesar. Caesar was translated by Arthur Goldig in 1565, Caesar's husband, Livy and Tacitus, before the end of the century, Livy and Tacitus, before the end of the uh, 16th century, uh, Tacitus, translated, Livy, and, and this. And then you had what is called, you know, Sir Thomas North, Famous note, this is not the Prutaps, 
Lives of noble Grecians and Romans. Sir Thomas North. Translated. Sir Thomas North. North. My name is Sir Thomas. Sir, <laughs> not Sir. Thomas Matt. That is my no, no, sir. No. Because I am not a, uh, I am not a knight. Knight, knights are allowed to use this, sir. So, sir, Thomas, no. Plutarch's lives, very famous, no. Plutarch. Plutarch's lives of noble Grecians and Romans. See that? A noble person uh, of morals. See that? Sir Thomas Nell. And this person politics and morals. Again, politics and morals. See, I hope you are writing these things now. Because our body is a small one. Small is beautiful. <laughs> yes. So you have got this now. Yes. So that is another thing. Then you have got Nam Isocrates. In 1534, <coughs> he was translated by uh, Thomas Eliot. Thomas Eliot. Translated Isocrates. In 15, sorry, in 15, uh, he was translated in 1534. Now, all during this Renaissance, understand? And poets and dramatists, Aristotle. Homer, part of partial translation of Homer is available. Theocritus, Terence, the comedian Terence, Horace, Virgil, Ovid, Virgil, Ovid, or names familiar to you, I think, Virgil, Ovid, then Terence, Terence, uh, Seneca, Seneca, see, Cicero, all the Roman or this dramatis and writers of comedy and so on, voice and work like So another thing is interesting is that not only they they did not confine themselves to translating books by the ancients, that is Greeks and Romans, but Middle Ages books, books written and made published, books written and not published, but books written in Middle Ages and even moderns. For example, St. Augustine, that was a very, uh, you remember, I remember, I told you about St. Augustine, isn't it? The church man, the theologian, St. Augustine, both use, B-O-E-T-H, uh, Consolations of Philosophy, De Consolatione Philosophie, we have come across this somewhere, isn't it? Erasmus, Calvin, Martin Luther, Calvin, theologian. Erasmus, also theologian, famous, and uh, Martin Luther, the, the person who protested against the uh, Roman authority. So this, Martin, I protest, he said. And then there began uh, Protestantism, or Reformation. Reformation itself was a, and again, a, is a, a product of Renaissance. Isn't it? Yeah. So this is what you see, the situation. So what we have done is so far is now we'll continue this in the next class. That is the we, we are now dealing with the problem of recognition. There are three problems. One is problem of recognition. Second is orthography, and third is enrichment. Today we have been discussing few points about problem of uh, problem of uh, recognition, and the reason the background is classical tradition. Classical tradition means use of. Uh, Latin and uh, Greek. Against this, you have got the vernacular tradition. Vernacular means native languages, popular languages. There we saw classical tradition. That how defenders? One is defenders of classical tradition. Isn't it? Defenders of classical tradition. Uh, this uh, against this, you have champions of modern, isn't it? Modern languages. That is Vernacris. One of them we said already, Richard Malcastro. Yes. And then you have got the second point was, you know, popular demand. Isn't it? Popular demand. 
popular demand. And third one we saw, what is the third point? The translation, translators. So then here what happens is that the translators, of course translations is, we can say it's because of the popular demand. And you saw all these great authors, at least you have come across these things. Yes. So champions of modern languages and champions of classical languages. So they had to fight, you know, it's a battle. Ancients and moderns. So uh, the ancients, what they said about the language, what moderns said about the language, etc. So we have come up to the translations and tomorrow we will have two or three po more points more. Next class we will have two or three points more and then we will conclude that first problem. How? How English solved the problem number one, that is the problem of recognition, we will continue, uh, continue attending and stay subscribed, I always say, because you will always get, the, you will get, always get an alert whenever I upload uh, a very, uh, what, uh, very relevant video. A, a video may be relevant for you, suppose you are preparing for your PG or even undergraduate course. This, I think is every university, this is a, a compulsory uh, subject, that is the history of the English language. So stay subscribed and also ask your friends to subscribe. Understand? If you find this are useful. Okay? So see you again with uh, more points as far as recognition is or the solution for the first problem is concerned. Till then, bye. Have a nice day. Enjoy your day.